Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Kosuke. I guess I created Jenkins a while ago. So today I wanted to talk about the continuous stability. Now, before I get there, where I wanted to start is what Ford did 100 years ago. I think in this audience, most of you probably know what assembly line is, but you might not know that how disruptive this technology was. So um, with the assembly line, the Ford was able to bring down the cost of assembling a car from 12.5 hours just down to 1.5. So it's an order of magnitude improvement. So this wasn't just you know, getting a 10% more productivity out of the workforce or that sort of thing. It was a complete game changer. So it was so much so, it was productive so much so that the Ford was able to assemble you know, 300,000 cars just with 13,000 employees, which is more cars than the next 300 competitors combined, which took 65,000 people. So if you are in the boardroom of the competing companies from Ford, this must have been how it looks like, right? You know, this kind of change, it doesn't happen in one day. It, take, it takes time to really like, you know, fully play out. So you might not be in a trouble immediately, but you're gonna clearly see the, uh, the, uh, the storm gathering down the horizon. And I know the company who failed to act in these cases, because you know, the, I used to work for some microsystems, just like Paul, and we all know what happened to that company. Um, so the, I think the similar thing, the very similar transformation is happening in the industry at the moment, which is to say the software is eating the world. Right? And um, the good example that we, are, that we always like to bring up is Tesla, um, which I understand is, is here, I guess. Um, so the Teslas, um, the, you know, they built this uh, the amazing sort of the car that I think they created a shockwave in the industry. So for example, this car is capable of updating itself over the air while it's sitting in the garage. Now if you 10 years ago, I bet that if you went to one of the major car manufacturing company and that they told them that your car should be upgradable outside the dealership, I'm sure they're gonna laugh at you. But now in 2017, this is a new baseline that everyone is trying to strive for. And then, you know, the another example of how disruptive this kind of change is, uh, when they had an accident where I believe the, uh, something scratched the bottom of the car and then caught the fire, the way they fixed it is by just delivering the software upgrade. So the regulatory bodies, the government agency, this is a whole new way of fixing the problem, so they had to scramble to keep up with the way they did it. And of course, like we also know that the, uh, the one day they announced that, hey, Tesla owners, your cars now have this auto driving capability, that's great. Uh, that's again unheard of for the car to get the value after they driven out of the parking lot of the dealership. That was unheard of. Right? So now it's kind of like a starting, the cars is sort of changing into a platform where you can innovate more values. And then that, all that value that's happening is in the software. And the rest of you think this is the last thing that the software is adding to the car. Well, we all know that the more interesting things are coming down the horizon, it's gonna create yet another big disruption. So, um, you know, I think this is what we mean you know, when we say the software is eating the world. And this kind of transformation has a very devastating impact. So, you know, the, when the digital came to photography, I like taking pictures. Um, there, there used to be a huge company known to everyone in the household, Kodak. My daughter has no idea what this company does. And, uh, you know, the, when it's gone, it's, it's, so interestingly, it's the same quote that the uh, Paul used. Uh, but um, you know, if, if you fail to adapt, so the good thing is that the, you know, people in this room, I think, are forefront of this change. But the bad thing is if you fail to act, then you're gonna be irrelevant. And then don't take my word for it, well, naturally, like take Paul's word for it, but this is also why a lot of the analysis industries are saying that this, like, you know, the demand for the software, the demand for writing more applications more quickly is the biggest problem that faces us today. It's sort of, it, that's, that's, that's the thing that's driving all of us crazy, is like we gotta deliver more features like yesterday. But, so we have to do faster, things do, you know, we have to deliver software faster and faster, but we also know that the just adding more speed 
to a process that already has a lot of frictions, it's going to result in a lot of heat, and eventually these things going to explode. Right? We know how hard it is to deliver software. Um, you can't just make it 10 times faster without something fundamentally changing down beneath. So I think this is the context in which the continuous stability is getting a lot of attraction for, right? You know, it's, try, it's the activity, it's the act of trying to automate everything from the source code commit all the way down to the software hitting the productions. Now, and um, the, the thing, I think the one reason is that the, sort of the, the term continuous stability, um, the sort of elevated above the technical people is that it kind of speaks the business value, right? The, when you, by, by being able to produce value to production more quickly, we can get the feedback from production now back to the development more rapidly. So despite, you know, despite the effort we spend on trying to get the right product developed in the first place, ultimately you're never gonna get, get, it, you know, get to know how the market reacts until you take it to the product. So in some sense, it's really important that you be able to sort of go through these cycles more rapidly so that you can quickly adjust to the unforeseeable outcome that happens in the market. Now, the same thing seen from the technical perspective, in some sense, is actually nothing new. So we've been doing this automation all along, right? And then from the decade ago, we've been saying, you know, the agile as a way of sort of more rapidly and iteratively work on the upstream of the project development. And uh, around the time I started doing the software called Jenkins, you know, we are talking about the continuous integration, which is about running builds and tests more rapidly. So now, you know, simply put, we are doing more and more automation, and that's sort of spreading more and more toward the downstream of the development, getting close to the operations and productions. And then and as a result of automating the whole chain, now we can see the entire cycle go faster, which you no, know, we was able to produce this business value that we were just talking about a moment ago. So um, now when we talk about the continuous stability, what we hear is all these like amazing companies doing great things, you know, that, you know, that likes like, you know, things like a Netflix is deploying 100 times a day or the Amazon is deploying almost every 10 seconds. You know, then, this is all, all you know, this is the, uh, all of what all of us want to be, this, tiger that's roaming around and killing, right? But then you kind of look around and what you see is, well, you know, it's, like, it's kind of far away. Like I, you see people like, uh, deploying by coordinating through the Google document or that the operations person has to go through the night to get the deployment or that the deployment is really only happening every two weeks. So you look around, this is what you see, and you hear these amazing companies, and then you sort of like wonder, this, this, like, this is huge gap that where you are and what you're supposed to be in, and you have no idea how to cross that. And you know, our industry, like people like me in some sense, is really not doing all that much help because we like to talk about all these different things in this industry from technology aspects, right? And it creates, in some sense, more confusion than helpful. Like it, it, it creates this analysis paralysis in the mind of so many people. So the, when things like that happen, I think it's important to sort of step back and try to simplify, right? The, as an organization, when you think about how to go from that you know, cat to the tiger, well, you kind of have to understand where you are right now, and then you have to identify where, how far you're trying to go and then from there, map the, the journey of how to go from here to there. And I think in this sort of, try to put in this context, then you can, well, you have to have this context first in order to be able to meaningfully look at the technology because that's sort of a means to the end, right? And then this journey, I think, has uh, two tracks. Um, the first track, is, I think, is more of a, organizational, cultural, and almost like in the managerial, the other one being the technology. So let's you know, look at each of that a little bit, right? So, because as a technology people, I think we tend to sort of like a gross over this organizational aspect or the cultural aspect of like what it takes to do this continuous daily transformation in a company. So, you know, in the, uh, I, um, in the cloud base, I 
I, I had the pleasure of working with a lot of large-scale companies who are trying to do this kind of going, try to go through this kind of transformation. Um, so from that experience, we sort of started to develop this like a mental map of how to help people navigate in this environment, right? So on the uh, x-axis, I have a uh, different phases of software development from upstream toward the more toward the downstream. Because uh, often what you see is people start like automating or the more well, continuously doing the, the left-hand side of things, like uh, being agile or being continuously building and integrating. But as you try to add more downstream, more operational side of things to the mix, um, there's, a, there's a chasm that you need to cross. There's the people from different organizations, different culture, need to work together to automate the whole thing. So being able to sort of go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side in terms of the maturity is not, is not exactly trivial. Now, on the uh, y-axis, what I have is the uh, scale in which you ad adapt this kind of practice. So when I say at the bottom I have a team level, what that means is, you know, it's often, you often see this smart, like a young engineers in your team taking this kind of initiatives on their own hand and achieving very sophisticated automation within that team, right? But that's a very different thing from the enterprise as a whole, be able to adapt this kind of the uh, practice at, in mass, because now you're talking about educating people at the average level, not the, not the sort of like a cream of the crop being able to do that. And then scaling up the practice across the organization, to educating people, and making sure that it sort of like a gets in the minds of everybody, is a very different challenge from just leaving, the, leaving it up to a small number of champions to make it successful. So, I mean, so that's the, uh, the, the line that's like written in the middle. So, when I talked about the journey from where you start to how far you go, you can often think of the journey from like somewhere in this point to the somewhere else in this point. So, um, the, you know, the chasm that you have to cross is sort of like a multifold. For example, like if you think about the people, you know, the uh, on the x-axis, x, x axis, right? The developer engineers tend to like moving fast and innovating more rapidly. Operations people, they have a different priority. They gotta, keep, they gotta make sure that the key stuff is up and running. So for them, the best situation is there will be no changes because then, then you know how to keep that up and running. So to be, in order to bring these two groups together, it's fundamentally not a technology challenge, but really the cultural challenge. So that's why I think this is an important aspect. Um, the, the, uh, the scale, the sort of, the, the bridging the scale aspect is also very difficult. You know? the, again, it used to be that this kind of thing is something that the technology people took on. So there are never, for better or worse, there was no visibility at the top of the level. But now the continuous table is something that every company needs to do. So there's, you know, there's now we see more and more executive level support and then people trying to do this at a large scale. Um, but even in those cases, you know, it's often helpful to think of this as a, uh, you know, the identifying the small team that drives this effort to the success and then try to replicate it up as opposed to like doing the big bang. So again, if you think about the adoption of how to make this kind of large scale DevOps or the continuous every transformation successful, then uh, having this kind of mental map is useful before you dive in to the details. But with all that said, obviously, the, the big part of this continuous delivery transformation is the technology practice as well. So let's look at that a little too. Now, the, the journey of the continuous delivery sort of touches many different things uh, in the, from the technology perspective. But I think all of those kind of starts from the automations, right? Because if you look at the Wikipedia definition of a continuous delivery, it sort of clearly calls out that the uh, key enabler for CD is a straightforward and repeatable deployment uh, process. Uh, that in, you know, and then with that, the only way to make this kind of thing happen, aside from being Japanese and being diligent about things, uh, is, to, um, is, to, uh, to, is through the automations. And that's what enables you to do the same thing more reliably over and over. Now, the, um, but that's sort of like a, just a one layer of the building blocks. There's actually many dimensions to this kind of the technological, tra technology transformation in CD. And then um, it's sort of multifaceted. 
So if you look at, for example, the architecture, there are a number of techniques that enable you to sort of contain changes. I think the key, so the key dilemma for the technical people in doing the CD is this fear that, well, like we obviously cannot ship crap into the production, so we have to come up with ways to essentially like contain and isolate damages, right? We are all humans, so as engineers, we do make mistakes. So we have to take measures so that that mistake doesn't end up causing the entire production to go on fire. So feature flags, for example, from that perspective is a one means to that end because it allows you to activate and kill certain aspects of the code at the runtime without you know, re recompiling and retesting and redeploying the whole thing. So you can sort of react to the changes in the production more quickly. For example, the new features, if it's causing trouble, it could disable it. In dark launch, I think this is probably the made most famous by Facebook uh, Messenger launch, right? You know, at the Facebook had to, at one point, they decided to launch this, uh, essentially, the chat platform. The way they did it is um, the long before the users can see features, uh, the code was made part of the production of Facebook. And when you load Facebook page, behind the scene, the script was emulating your communicating with your friends. So they were essentially testing the things in production. So like all these users of the Facebook was unknowingly participating in the load test. So they were able to iron out all the kinks, and then by the point of, uh, by the time they uh, announced this publicly, within a day, I believe that quite a several billions of people are using these new features, uh, but you know, the, the whole system worked because they were already like, well load tested. Um, and this is a kind of technique that you know, is only, again, another way of um, uh, isolating the, the damage, right? Like, you know, if in a traditional company, you couldn't think of the testing things in production, but this is another way to do it. Um, microservices had similar benefits in the sense that like you, like you, know, you can deploy just one component or like a, the another part separately without needing the coordinations. And this coordinating pieces between releases often becomes a large part of the overhead of creating a release. Um, another obvious technique in sort of isolating and controlling changes is to build this continuous delivery pipelines. So you can, you can design this branching pattern or the, the Jenkins jobs or automations carefully so that it essentially acts as a checkpoint at the different phases of the development. And you can line up the test at different kind of tests at the right moment, at the right frequency, uh, generally so that you can weigh the cost of the, uh, the test versus the feedback speed. Right? So early on, you want to have a, like a faster, smaller test that in the hope of catching a you know, good number of the problems so that the common problem gets caught more rapidly with uh, quick feedback cycles. But as the change sort of moves through to the, uh, uh, to the downstream, um, you want to you wanna create more, you want to run more expensive tests that, that catch the diverse, you know, the, the, the catch the problems that are harder to catch uh, until it hits the productions. So it, it used to be that the automation was you know, people just put things where they can. Now you can actually weigh in the value of different changes at the different points uh, and then carefully line them up so that uh, you get the maximum benefit. Um, the infrastructure also plays a role in it. Like you need to be, so various deployment techniques like a blue-green deployment or the canary deployment is a way of essentially removing the, uh, well, reducing the risk from the deployment, right? If the new version fails, then you have quick, you, you have ability to quickly go back to the previous successful versions. So that allows you to sort of have more peace of mind or more safety in trying out the new version, which is also almost always risky. Um, and then the, uh, the number of techniques like a mutable infrastructure also helps you build this confidence even further. But the, the thing with this practice is some of them like, can be only meaningfully done after you've attained certain level of the deployment speed. So if you're only releasing like every once in quarter, you obviously can't do this like a testing in production things that I described about the Facebook Messenger. Right, so some of these practices, even for engineers, does involve like, you know, the first crawling and then walking and run. Because at each step of the journey, 
there's always next step of activities that you can take on. And collectively, over time, you get faster and faster, but you can't just from zero to 60 in one day. So um, the, that's the sort of like a context in which I think a lot of people are looking for tools like Jenkins to be able to sort of help assist this journey. Um, because uh, you know, Jenkins is the uh, number one automation platform for CI and CD. Like, you know, we, when, we, when you think about the uh, cycle from deployment to productions, um, it's, the, uh, it's one of the few tools that could automate the whole chain together. And um, the, the other thing that the Jenkins got is this amazing ecosystem, right? In a sense, the software is less important than, than, than the, uh, the community that's able to produce it. And uh, because we have so many diversity in this industry, the Jenkins community was able to produce all sorts of plugins that would work with just about any tools under the sun that covers the entire horizon. And uh, if you look at the surveys, you see that the, this is by far the most dominant uh, uh, software in the market and adoption is still growing quite nicely. And I was sort of uh, um, the, you know, the, I, I sort of lost track of like, how is it possible that the installation is still growing? Because I, I, you know, it feels like everyone is already using it. So like where, where else I'm getting this additional installation? Now I have no idea. But if you look at the numbers, just over the past 12 months, the Jenkins installation around the world has grown more than uh, the, the 37% up to the 150,000. And uh, the workload that the people are putting on top of it is now the 12 million. So that's 50% uh, growth year over year. Um, and then the number of build agents has also grown more than 40% to, uh, to a little more than a half a million. So still a lot of the demand is coming to the automation. I think a more and more automated work needs to happen, even among the people who already use Jenkins. Is, I think that's what we are seeing in these numbers. And you know why these uh, people seem to be continue to rely on Jenkins, this decade old software? I think it's partly because um, it's the extensibility and the ease of use. That's something we've been spending a lot of effort over the last year with things like Blue Ocean and Pipeline, for which I believe we have a talk uh, later today by uh, another person from uh, Clavis. Um, and uh, you know, Jenkins is capable of connecting everything, um, and again, because uh, in this industry, we have so many things. This ability to connect things, I think, is critical to drive the bigger automations. So with these things, I think the developers around the world sort of see Jenkins as one of the key pieces of the puzzles to get going faster. Um, and again, you, know, you don't need to take my word for it. You know, through the Clavis, the company, like, you know, we were able to help lots of Main Street organizations, not just the cutting edge guys like people in this room, uh, deliver faster. Um, and then you know, getting more features out to the customers and keeping their users happy. So that's sort of what I wanted to tell you, um, that you know, I think a lot of people in this room, like I said, is in the forefront of this change. And I hope uh, you know, this today and the yesterday, you learned the, uh, you, you, know, you, you renew the resolve to eat the world. Thank you very much.